appreciate everyone uh, here tonight. I think the last time that uh, we uh, studied the Hebrews, we stopped at Hebrews third chapter, verse eleven through thirteen. I'm not sure if I stopped at thirteen or eleven, or we just start chapter uh, verse thirteen, uh, verse eleven. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's have a uh, short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study of thy word, and we're grateful for the eternal truths that are contained therein. And we pray, Father, that these truths may be, become more dominant in our lives as we study them and dwell upon them and think about our heavenly home. Pray now that the uh, Keep us in thy care, be with all those who may be uh, suffering from any sort of malady. And we pray, Father, that thy blessings will be upon thy word wherever it may go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It says in verse. Uh, <clears throat> 11, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And you uh, keep in mind that he's uh, speaking of the nation of Israel after they came out of Egypt. <clears throat> and I don't know how long they spent in the wilderness, but it wasn't very long before they came to Kadesh Barnea and then the spies were sent out. And they were so afraid, except for uh, Joshua and Caleb, they were so afraid. Because, you know, after all, they're giants in the land. And then you know, they just consider themselves to be grasshoppers. So, and here it's described, uh, you know, I almost did a lesson. I may still do it on uh, those attributes of God that are somewhat distressing, like wrath, anger, vengeance things like that. But these are righteous uh, attributes of God. His wrath is a righteous wrath. It is right for him to uh, be wrathful. And that's not you, buddy. Be wrathful <laughs> towards those that uh, are in sin. And he says, they're not to enter my rest. I'm going to have a, a little... Uh, not a little blurb, but a blurb on this uh, word rest because it is an important aspect of the book of Hebrews. He says, Beware, brethren, lest there be of any of you, what well, I was going to say that uh, at Cadius Barnea, they, they didn't go in, so God said, you know, those 20 and over, except for uh, Joshua and Caleb, you're not going in. You're going to stay around in this wilderness, and you're all going to die off because you didn't believe me. And uh, you, you had an evil heart. And that evil heart was a, in this case, was a just a, a reluctant heart, a heart of unbelief that didn't believe God when he said he would protect them going in, that he's going to give them the land. He said, uh, Lest there be an in interview of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Yeah, you might notice here that they were departing from God. God was not departing from them. God was always faithful to his promises. And if they had obeyed him, he would have taken them into the promised land and, and given it to them then. But they departed from him. And that's the way it is with any sin. God is always faithful. We're the ones that depart. But exhort, it, exhort uh, one, one another uh, daily. And uh, as I mentioned here, we need to exhort one another because sin itself is deceitful. You know, that many times we get caught up in something that we just... Uh, I mean, either we didn't have enough experience or wisdom or what have you, but we thought a thing was a good thing. We thought it was in harmony with God's will, and it wasn't. 
sometimes we um, we're enticed by sinfulness because it seems to us to be wholesome. You know, like uh, Eve, she was caught up in the deceitfulness of sin. So, deceitfulness of sin, it will harden you. And a hardened heart is, of course, one that uh, you can't uh, appeal to it. You can't uh, reason with it. Uh, it's not subject to uh, uh, or persuasion of anything else. You just set. And that's what sin uh, will do. And now if Paul is actually writing this, you know, he's telling the Hebrew Christians to exhort one another, but he's also at the same time telling them to exhort him. You know, he needed exhortation just as much as anybody else did. So this is a uh, encouragement to everyone to exhort one another. And if we look at the, the Romans the seventh chapter, the verses 13 through 25, and this is why Paul needed uh, exhortation. He, has, he says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandments might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me the deceitfulness of sin. For I know that in me there, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, and, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. But if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do, the, do it, but sin that dwells in me. Uh, while we're in this body of the flesh, we're subject to to all sorts of temptations. And um, we're also subject to seductions. And I think there's a, there is a difference between temptation and, and seduction, but uh, we'll get in that later. He says, I find then the law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, one warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with uh, the flesh, the law of sin. While we're in this flesh, we're, we're always subject to that. And keep in mind that... Uh, while Jesus was in the flesh, he was also subject to temptation. He was never subject to seducement. Uh, he always did the will of his Father in heaven. He never let temptation rule himself in any way. And Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, chapter verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, subjection lest... When I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So he needed exhortation just uh, like uh, anyone else did. So we're no different in that respect. Of course, Paul was an exceptional man. I, I uh, admit that, but uh, you know he needed exhortation as well. <clears throat> it says, for we have become partakers of Christ, that is, you know, we're uh, participating in, in uh, Christ if it's conditional. We are partakers if 
we hold the building of our confidence steadfast to the end. And we're going to get uh, later on, this, this word confidence is used later, and we'll uh, address that when we get to it. But in, in the 15th verse, it says, While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That's the uh, same as uh, verse 7. It's just an emphasis of what he said before. He says, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now, it's interesting in this uh, word, who. In King James, it says some. Um, they're different uh, Hebrew words for some and for who, but only very slightly. And the difference is that of the uh, accent mark. Now, you recall that uh, at this time the Greek language had no punctuation, no commas, nothing like that, no accent, nothing. So when the uh, translators translated this into the uh, Greek language, they didn't know where to put the, the uh, accent mark. If it's at the first of this word, and it's no use me pronouncing the word, if it's the uh, first of this uh, accents on the first part, it's an interrogative uh, pronoun. And if the accents on the uh, last part, it's an indefinite pronoun. So an indefinite would be some, and uh, interrogatory would be who. Now, speaking about punctuation, even those uh, writers of old realized that it was a problem that didn't have well, they didn't know anything about punctuation, so they couldn't say that it's a problem who didn't have punctuation. They just knew it was a problem to find out where a pause was. And when they, uh, eventually what happened when they finally figured that out, when they would write a section and there should be a pause, they would just start a new line. There's no punctuation. Well, that was kind of inefficient. Uh, you know, writing materials is kind of... Uh, scarce at that time, so when you do that, you know, your writings become longer. So gradually, uh, punctuation began to be used, and it really wasn't until the 1500s uh, with the invention of the printing press that we have punctuation like we have today. They may have used it a little differently, but you know, all the commas and what have you were there, periods and commas. and by the time the printing press came around, it was all there. But here, um, there's a question as to whether it should be some or who. You get to later on where it says whose and whom and stuff like that. It's very obvious that it's an in, in, uh, interrogatory pronoun. And probably it fits better here to be an interrogatory pronoun. I know that the... Uh, uh, most uh, well, if, if you go to a Greek uh, uh, text, the modern Greek text, he will have the accent on the first syllable, not the second, which means it should be who. So, probably, you know, it should be who. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt? Uh, led by Moses, and another reason I think probably some would be incorrect because the whole nation of Israel uh, rebelled. Now, no one was allowed to go in who was 20, age, 20 years of age and older except Caleb and Joshua. So uh, I think uh, who fits better the, the context, but you know, may have a different opinion on that. But anyway. But the whole nation uh, rebelled. And, of course, the young ones were not held accountable for that, but the, the whole nation rebelled. Uh, it says in verse 17 and uh, 19 through 19, 
Now, with whom was he angry for, uh, for uh, 40 years? And this is a, uh, it's not a rhetorical question because he's going to answer it. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Well, the answer is yes, it was though. That's with whom he was angry. God can be angry. God, there is a righteous anger. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? Now, he's saying this to uh, Hebrew Christians who had obeyed. And he was fearful that they would, well, reject their first love, and they'd be lost. He was afraid that they'd be lost. And we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know, the, the Jews that came out of uh, Egypt were part of one nation. And the Hebrew Christians are part of a spiritual nation. But both could be lost. Both can be lost. And the uh, uh, Jewish nation of Israel was lost. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is, was, was the problem. And we might note that they could not enter in because of unbelief. But it was not because of the enemies that they were to encounter. That had no bearing at all on whether or not they could have occupied the uh, land of promise. The reason they couldn't occupy the land of promise is because of their unbelief. <clears throat> and we could say that uh, uh, it says in, ver uh, in uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. And this sort of fear is fear of danger. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. He's telling them, you better look at yourself. You know the history of the uh, uh, nation of Israel that couldn't enter in because of unbelief. You're getting there. And you should fear, lest you should come short of entering that heavenly rest. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, a verse you know well, so let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and this is respect God, and fear what he can do, but to respect God and keep his commandments. And the, the New King James says this is uh, man's all, is what the Hebrew says, but uh, King James says this is the whole duty of man. In Romans 11, chapter, uh, verse 20, it says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But, and you stand by faith. They, they didn't have the faith. So do not be haughty, uh, but fear. Fear the consequences. And of course, um, Matthew seven twenty one, another verse that you know well, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. The Hebrew Christians were very close to not doing the will of of their Father in heaven. In verse 2 of the chapter 4, he says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And it may be a little unusual to, to say that the gospel, we think of the gospel as the New Testament. The gospel was uh, preached to them, and, and that uh, was preached. The preach is a word that we get uh, evangelized. So they they were evangelized as well as we are evangelized. And we have to think of a gospel as just uh, what it is, just good tidings. Good tidings were preached to the uh, Jews of old, but they didn't believe it. And as a result, they couldn't enter that uh, heavenly rest. But the word, that's logos, you can say the gospel again. The word which they heard 
did not profit them. You know, the gospel doesn't profit anybody that uh, won't obey it. If you won't obey the gospel, it's not going to do you any good. And the only way that you will obey the gospel if it is mixed with faith, that is, confidence and belief in, in uh, the one who uh, delivered the gospel, that is, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It wouldn't mix with faith uh, with those that uh, heard it. In verse 3, for we who have uh, believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. All the works, although the works uh, were finished from the foundation of the world, world, all these things were prepared beforehand. They were in the mind of God. They were implemented. Uh, but... You know, there is a rest for us. But these Israelites of old did not enter it, even though everything had been done to prepare uh, the place for them. Even before the world was uh, begun, it was already in the mind of God. For he has spoken, in verse uh, 4 and 5, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this, uh, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. So whatever rest, and you can't think of rest as a, uh, the idea that, you know, you're taking a nap, you're laying, kicking back and taking a nap. That's not the kind of rest that's been talked about, and we'll get into that a little later. But uh, here... When I enter my rest, that's the heavenly rest. In verse uh, 6 and 7, it says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, or some will enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, unbelief. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, and we'll uh, read that in a minute, saying in David, today, today, remember when it says today, that's an urgent matter. Today, after such a long time, it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And it was said by David in Psalms, the 95th chapter, verses 7 and 8, it says, therefore, he is our God, and we are his pe people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And the S, uh, ASV has Meribah. If you may recall, there was, there was a rebellion there because they didn't, uh, they wanted water. <laughs> and as in the day of trial, <clears throat> uh, that Meribah kind of means provocation. In the day of trial, ASV has uh, Massa, which uh, translated temptation, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So that's, that was what was spoken of so long ago by David. It was true then, and it is true now. <clears throat> it was true for the Hebrew Christians. It is true for the Christians of this day. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In Hebrew, the fourth chapter, verse <clears throat> 8, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. <clears throat> therefore, uh, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. <clears throat> now here is where we get to the... Uh, deal about rest, and I think I may have time to read this, but the word that's translated uh, rest was caraposis, uh, uh, yeah, you can correct my pronunciation if you want to, <laughs> that's fine, but right here, this word in verse 9, it's a, a sabbaticism, it's a different word. 
And this is the only place in the New Testament that this word is used. Now, the translators translated both of them rest because uh, they are a form of rest, so they see if I got time to, to read this. Uh, it has to do with rest. A, a keeping of a Sabbath, uh, sabbatismos, uh, sabbatismos, a keeping of a Sabbath, a rest on the Sabbath. In the New Testament, only used of an internal rest with God, Hebrews 4 9, which is what we read. It's the only place it's used. Therefore, the intimation is that the Sabbath was instituted as a symbol of that eternal rest at the completion of God's work. This rest remains with the people of God and is also called katapoiesis, a cessation from work or causing to cease work, putting to rest, repose. The teaching of the apostles as to the rest in its relation to the believer's life is confined to two passages in Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11, and Revelations 14 and 13, and that's been spoken of before too. The basis of the idea is the divine rest, divine rest, the rest on which God entered at the completion of his work of creation. Uh, participation in this rest is a divine gift to man. The natural tendency is to conceive rest as a mere cessation of work. In Hebrews 4 9, we have the word sabbatismos, referring to the rest which is going to be enjoyed by the people of God when their earthly work is finished. Have the word katapasis is used in, in uh, 4 verses 1 and 3 twice, and in 4 verses 5, 10, and 11, and also Hebrews 3 verse 11 and 18. Since the Jews shared this misapprehension, it was corrected by our Lord in Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. The word for rest here is anapocentai. Uh, it's a subjunctive, uh, the aorist subjunctive of anapocentai which means inner rest and refreshment, not due to the cessation of work, but to the result of the right performance of work, Matthew 11, verse 28, and 1 Peter 4, 14. The earthly labors of the Christian's life are ended at death. Its works, that is, habits, methods, and results, abide and remain in the new life. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 11, gives the most exhaustive treatment of this theme. The whole passage may be, uh, possibly be called a uh, discourse, having for its text the words of Psalms 95, verse 11, which we uh, read. <clears throat> the rest to which God refers, as quoted by the psalmist, is the divine rest after creation of which God, uh, Genesis 2, verse 2 speaks. And on the seventh day, God entered his work, which he made, in, uh, ended his work, which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. This passage links the idea of a divine rest indissoluble from the Sabbath. The writer's argument is briefly as follows. The inspired message in Psalm 95 speaks of a rest of God. The psalmist tells us how in the days of Moses this rest lay open to the God's people, but they did not enter it through disobedience. Neither then nor at the entry into Canaan under Joshua was, was the divine rest uh, realized. The psalmist, in fact, implies that the divine ideal still remains unrealized and still awaits fulfillment. And the author of Hebrews, taking the psalmist's word as the last utterance of the Old Testament on the subject of rest, applies it with confidence to his hearers of the New Testament epoch. He draws the inference that there remains, therefore, a rest, sabbatismos, uh, to the people of God, Hebrews 4.9. The word sabbatismos is used here purposely in lieu, in lieu of catapos, uh, the word employed throughout the remainder of the passage. It not only denotes the divine rest as a sabbatic rest, but it links together in a most suggestive way the end with the beginning, the consummation with the creation. It implies the rest which God gives is one which he also enjoys, just as in the case of salvation, the Christian rest, anaposis, 
may be viewed both as a present possession and a future blessing. On the one hand, we who have believed to enter into that rest, katapasin, our life of sin has ended, and we are enjoying the cessation of sin with a anapasin, the inner joy that we can have while in this life and work, while our true katapasis, or cessation of this life, is realized. Therefore, we as Christian believers enjoy the and opposite that inner rest which the Lord gives us while we are here on earth working and waiting for our catopposin. This is similar to the sabatimos which the Lord enjoyed and which he promises for his people. So there you have it on rest. <clears throat> and I see a lot of you are resting right now. So <laughs> but we'll have to take up uh, next time. After verse 9, verse 10...